Thanks to you all for coming back for the second installment about algebraic K-theory and trace methods. So today we're going to focus our discussion on topological cyclic homology and cyclotomic spectra. Um, but since I feel like a lot of math has happened between when we met uh, yesterday and today, I'd like to begin by recapping some things that we talked about yesterday. So let's begin with a short recap of some ideas from yesterday that will lead into our discussion today. So what was the goal of the overview we talked about yesterday? Well, it was the following. We said that for a ring or a ring spectrum, A, we wanted to study the algebraic K-theory of that ring. Okay, so that was our goal. And yesterday we talked about the trace method approach to studying this K-theory. So we said in particular there are maps, which are called trace maps that relate algebraic K-theory to something that's supposed to be more computable. And we went through that yesterday and we found that there were trace maps from algebraic K-theory factoring through what's called topological cyclic homology and then to topological Hochschild homology. Now I wanna remember a few key facts about some of these objects that will play into what we want to discuss today. So let's just remember a few things. So let's start with THH. What were some key properties of topological Hochschild homology? Well, the first thing to remember is that this was defined as a topological analog of, well, that's not how you spell that, analog of classical Hochschild homology of a ring. So we developed that yesterday. And when you do that, what you get out of that is an S1 spectrum. And in particular, we said that it's this kind of S1 spectrum, which was called cyclotomic, which we're going to talk much more about today. Now, from topological Hochschild homology, we then are supposed to be able to define topological cyclic homology. So this thing is defined from THH using that cyclotomic structure. And the point, the whole thing that makes trace methods go is that um, topological cyclic homology is a good approximation to algebraic K-theory. So in nice situations, this is a good approximation to K-theory and we can recover information about K-theory by studying topological cyclic homology. Okay, so we talked about that last time, but the question that we left yesterday unaddressed is, well, this method only works if we can actually compute TC, right? I mean, the claim is that that's supposed to be more computable, but if we can't compute it, you know, this method um, fails us. So the question for today is how do we compute, how do we understand topological cyclic homology? So that's the big question. And I want to mention uh, right up front that there are sort of two approaches to this question. We'll discuss both of them today. We're going to start from the classical approach. So the classical approach comes out of the classical definition of topological cyclic homology, which is due to Bokstad, Shang, and Madsen. And I'll recall that for you in a moment. But there's also a new approach to topological cyclic homology due to Thomas Nicolaus and Peter Schulze. Um, from work that was published in 2018. And so we'll get to that as well. And part of what I wanna do today is talk about um, these two approaches, how they're related, and what are the uh, some advantages of this new Nikolaus Schultz perspective computationally. Okay, but to get there, we really need to understand the classical approach first. And so let's start from there. So this is also recalling something that we discussed uh, last time. So the boxstead shang madsen definition of topological cyclic homology, as we gave it yesterday, was the following. The topological cyclic homology of a ring A at the prime P was what we get when we look at fixed points of topological Hochschild homology. So we said topological Hochschild homology has this S1 action. We look at the cyclic group sitting inside S1, and we can take fixed points. And then we were supposed to take a limit over some maps, R and F. And let me just remind you that this map F, it was easy enough to say what it is. The map F from the CP fixed points to the CP to the N minus one fixed points, that map was just inclusion of fixed points. And I could do that for any equivariant spectrum. That didn't have anything, didn't, wasn't really special to THH. But the other map R, 
the restriction map. This was the map that I said yesterday uses the cyclotomic structure. Okay, so that's where we left things yesterday in terms of our overview of trace methods. And now today, if we're gonna understand topological cyclic chromology, we're gonna have to really unpack some of these things. So looking at this, I've immediately got some questions. Here's a question I have. My first question is, what do these fixed points even mean? So what do these fixed points mean? And my second question is, what is this map R? If I'm using it so fundamentally in the definition of topological cyclic homology, we need to know what it is. So those are the two um, related questions that we're gonna start from today. Okay, so to get started, I wanna uh, maybe recall one last thing from last time. Sorry, I said I was done recalling, I'm not quite. Let me recall one more thing, which is that we said topological Hochschild homology uh, is an S1 spectrum. And I mentioned last time that THH is actually, can be constructed as what's called a genuine S1 spectrum. So I wanna talk a little bit today to start with about what that means. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take a little detour. I'm gonna set aside THH for the moment. That's our motivation for these things, but I wanna take a little detour where I'm gonna say some basic things about equivariant stable homotopy theory. So let's have a little detour into some basics of equivariant stable homotopy theory. So topological Hochschild homology is our motivation, certainly, for considering the um, constructions I'm about to talk about, but this is going to hold in a more general setting. So in particular, I'm going to let G be a compact Lie group. And I first want to talk about what does it mean to be a G spectrum or a genuine G spectrum? So a G spectrum, I'll call it X, is built out of G spaces. Okay, so a G spectrum is built out of G spaces, which I'll call X of V. And V here is a finite dimensional G representation. So when we think about ordinary spectra, our ordinary spectra we think of as being built out of spaces, you know, X1, X2, X3, et cetera. And now I'm saying these G spectra are also built out of spaces, but now they're G spaces. And now I have one attached to these finite dimensional representations in my group, living in some what we call universe, some collection of representations that I'm interested in. Now these also have some structure maps to, uh, with them. So we have together with G maps, and what do these structure maps look like? Well, now my structure maps are gonna take XV and they're going to be maps from, well, now with my ordinary spectra, what do you have? You have your structure maps where you smash with say S1. Now I'm gonna be able to smash with representation spheres. And I land then in XV plus W. So representation spheres are one point compactifications of representations. And one way to think about what just happened in this definition is that you know, with ordinary spectra, um, we can invert suspension, so sort of the idea of what's happening with ordinary spectra. And with these equivariant spectra, you can also invert suspension, but you can invert suspension by representation spheres. Uh, Tina, okay, sorry, so that's... Tina, sorry to have interrupted you. Uh, do you consider uh, orthogonal representations only here? Yeah, so I'm, I am working in, so what I'm saying right now is like sort of a, genuine comment about what G spectra are, um, but you pick some points at model for these categories. So most of what I'm saying implicitly, I'm living in a orthogonal G spectra, um, but I'm not gonna really dive too deep into what that means. Um, okay, so, right. So this is what I mean when I talk about these equivariant spectra. And now one of my questions that I wanted to address is what are these fixed points that I've been claiming that we need to understand? So let's let X be one of these genuine G spectra. So X is a genuine G spectrum and H in G is a subgroup. And I wanna ask, well, what are these fixed points? What does it mean to take a fix, the fixed points of such a spectrum? So I'm gonna write the fixed points as X superscript H. Okay, so what, what are fixed points here? So I wanna tell you uh, what this spectrum is, this fixed point spectrum. And so I wanna tell you what is the Vth space of this. 
And the V space of the spectrum is, it's kind of the thing that you might guess it to be, which is that I take my spectrum X, I take the V space of that, and then I take the H fixed points of that space. Now, this only makes sense if this representation V is a G representation that was fixed by H. So in other words, what you get out of this when you take the fixed points of a G spectrum is you get a G mod H spectrum. Okay, so that's nice. These are the kinds of fixed points that we're talking about when I say we're taking fixed points of THH. And on the surface, it looks like that was a nice thing to do. Um, it turns out that it was actually not such a nice thing to do um, because these fixed points are really badly behaved. So maybe that's like a theme in mathematics, things that are easy to define are badly behaved. Um, so what do I mean when I say they're not behaved well? Well, for instance, a thing that's true in spaces that you would hope would be true in spectra is the following. I'd like it to be true that when I take X smash Y, if I had two G spectra and I smash them together and take the H fixed points of that, I would like that to be the same as the H fixed points of X smash the H fixed points of Y. And sadly, for this notion of fixed points, those are not the same. Another sort of nice thing that we would want to be true is the following. If I have a G space and I take the suspension spectrum of it, I would hope that when I take the fixed points of that, I get the suspension spectrum of the fixed points. And again, that is not the case. So this notion of fixed points is um, easy to sort of characterize, but is badly behaved in some sense. Um, and I'll say maybe more about that in a few minutes. So there's another notion of fixed points that's better behaved, which is called geometric fixed points. So when we talk about the geometric fixed points of a spectrum, we write it like this, phi h of x, that's one notation for it anyway. And let me tell you how to define geometric fixed points. So the first thing I need if I'm gonna define these geometric fixed points is I need to define I'm going to let F sub H be the family of subgroups of my group G that uh, which do not contain H. So family um, is not just like, I'm not just choosing the word family. It has a technical meaning here. So there's some technical meaning of what it means to be a family, which has to do with it being closed under subconjugacy. I'm not going to worry too much about that right now. But when you have such a family, you're able to attach a space to it, which is called the universal FH space. So I'm gonna write E F sub H for the universal FH space. And what this thing is, is that it's a G space and it's characterized by the following property. So it's characterized by the following. If you have your E F H, and maybe let's add a disjoint base point, so the lower plus is a disjoint base point. When I take fixed points of that for some other subgroup K that lives in my group G, one of two things happens. Either this is equivalent to S0 if K is in the family, or it's a point if K is not in the family. Okay, so that's um, the property that characterizes this universal F sub H space. And maybe this is a little bit clearer if I give you an example. And this example is gonna be important for us because this is gonna be really, uh, the example might seem silly when I write it down, but this is actually gonna be the example that we're gonna use going forward. So let's say that my subgroup H is CP and my big group is CP to the N, okay? So I'm thinking of CP sitting inside CP to the N and I wanna know what is this family F sub CP? Okay, it's supposed to be the family of subgroups of CP to the N, which do not contain CP. Well, there's not much in that family. So the only thing in that is the trivial subgroup. So what does that mean for us? Well, if you compare this property characterizing uh, EFs H to what we have characterizing sort of our usual universal spaces, EG, you see that EFCP is just ECP in the usual sense, a contractible space with a free CP action. 
Um, oh, I see a question. What is the plus above the example? Uh, oh, right, this plus here, yeah, sorry. This plus here is, and I'll, we'll see that throughout, is just notation for adding a disjoint base point to make this, this space a pointed space. Okay, so um, so in this this nice example, what we're recovering is our usual notion of like a universal space EG. Okay, so why do I mention these universal spaces? Well, I'm meant to be defining what the geometric fixed points are, and here's how we define them. So I have this space EFH plus, and there's a map from that space to S naught, which is just projection onto the non base point. So it sends everything except the base point to the non base point of S naught. And that map has a cofiber. And I'm just going to name the cofiber of that map to be EFH tilde. Okay, so that's just notation. And what are the geometric fixed points then? Well, the geometric fixed points of my space are what you get, sorry, my, my spectrum X are what you get when you take this EFH tilde, smash it with X, and take the H fixed points in the sense that we talked about above. So that might look bad. I mean, maybe it's not so intuitive why we just did that, but I claim that this is a much nicer, in many ways, notion of fixed points. So now those properties that we wanted before, like that it behaved nicely with respect to smash product and suspension spectra of spaces, those all now hold for geometric fixed points. So this is a more well-behaved notion of fixed points. Let me note something that's important about these geometric fixed points. I'm going to rewrite uh, this uh, sequence that I have here one more time, space it out a little bit differently. Well, if I, let me say what I'm doing. So if I take this whole sequence and I smash it with X, what do I get? I get a sequence that looks like the following. I smash with X there, S not smashed with X is just X. And then I get E, F, H tilde smashed with X. So I just smashed my sequence with X. And now I'm gonna H fix the whole sequence. So I'm gonna take H fix points of the whole thing. And what do I see when I do that? Well, if you look at this right hand object, well, that was just the definition of the H geometric fixed points. And these are the fixed points that we had above. So what we've just learned is that you always have a map from the fixed points, sometimes those are called the categorical fixed points, to the geometric fixed points. So you always have a map relating the two. Okay. So geometric fixed points, I've just told you, are sort of some nicer maybe notion of fixed points um, in some ways. But why do they enter our story? So why are we interested in geometric fixed points in the context of what we're talking about today? Well, it comes into this idea of a spectrum being cyclotomic. So we're going to see two definitions of cyclotomic spectra today, a classical one, and then we'll see this sort of Niklaus Schulze characterization a bit later. So I'm going to write this as the classical definition. So what does it mean? Um, oh, sorry, I see a question in the the um, the chat, which is is X a space or a spectrum so far? My X is a spectrum. These constructions, uh, right? X is a spectrum. We're talking about uh, genuine G spectrum, so spectra so far. So the classical definition of what it means to be cyclotomic is the following: a cyclotomic spectrum is a genuine S1 spectrum X together with compatible equivalences as follows. So the equivalences are supposed to be from the CN geometric fixed points of X back to X for all N. So I'll call this little r. Um, you have to be maybe a tiny bit more careful, um, or maybe it's just a bit sloppy to write it this way, because the thing that I have on the left here, these fixed points, well, what is this? Well, this is now an S1 mod CN spectrum. So you first identify that back to an S1 spectrum using the isomorphism given by the nth root. So consider that as an S1 spectrum. So a cyclotomic spectrum is a spectrum like this. It's like saying that when you take the geometric fixed points, you somehow get something back that's equivalent to the original spectrum. 
which seems, I mean, sort of like a strange condition. Like, why would you ever expect that to be the case? Um, but it turns out that there are examples of these kinds of things. And in particular, topological Hawk shield homology is cyclotomic. In, uh, sorry to have interrupted you. The, we received a question. Uh, are the categorical fixed points lex or oplex monoidal? Um, right. Yeah, let me return to that when we talk a little bit later about some properties of these different kinds of fixed points. Okay. Um, so uh, the... Okay, so topological Hawk shield homology is cyclotomic, and I, I claimed earlier that that restriction map, that R map between fixed points was supposed to depend on that cyclotomic structure. So now we're ready to answer the question, so what is the map R from the CP to the N fixed points of topological Hawk shield homology to the CP to the N minus one fixed points? Well, here's how that map is defined. So I'm starting with the CP to the N fixed points, and I can identify that as taking the CP fixed points and then the CP to the N minus one fixed points. So I've just rewritten it in that way. Um, and now I have a map. So we said that we always have a map from the fixed points to the geometric fixed points. So I'm going to take these CP fixed points inside and map them to the CP geometric fixed points of topological Hawk shield homology. And I've still got those CP to the N minus one fixed points on the outside. But now topological Hawk shield homology is cyclotomic. So I have a map from the geometric fixed points back to the original spectrum topological Hawk shield homology. And that composite is that restriction map um, for THH. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about what are those fixed points in the definition of TC and what is this restriction map also in the definition of TC. And so the question now really becomes, well, how do we compute these fixed points? If we're gonna recover topological cyclic homology from this kind of perspective, we need to be able to compute these fixed points. Now, a sad thing in homotopy theory, or maybe it's not sad, it produces a lot of interesting mathematics, but a thing in homotopy theory is that these, these categorical fixed points are in general very difficult to compute. So there's one method that has long been used when you need to understand fixed points, which is to try to relate them to something more computable, which is yet another notion of fixed points. So I apologize, but I'm now gonna introduce a third notion of fixed points, which uh, are called homotopy fixed points. Uh, Tina, there is a question about the second map uh, used to define uh, the capital R. Is it an isomorphism? Yeah, so that's an interesting point that you've got there, which is that yes, I mean, the, the condition of being cyclotomic tells you that this map, um, that last map in that composite has to be an equivalence. But we're not actually using that in this definition of the restriction map because it's going in the correct direction for us. So maybe in, to define this restriction map, we actually need a bit less. Um, but, uh, but yes, it is the case for topological Hawk shield homology or any cyclotomic spectra that that map is indeed an equivalence. Um, okay, so, right, uh, homotopy fixed points. So fixed points in general are hard to compute and I claim that this idea of homotopy fixed points is gonna be more computationally accessible. But first I have to tell you what it is. So what are the homotopy fixed points? So for X, a G spectrum, the homotopy fixed points of the spectrum are what you get when you take maps function spectra from EG plus to X and then take the G fixed points of that. Okay, so um, one question you could ask is like, well, how is that related to the regular fixed points that you take? And here's an answer to that. So you have a projection map from EG plus to S naught. We've already used that same map. That's the map that then projects onto the non-base point. And that map induces a map from X to this function spectrum, functions from EG plus to X. So if you G fix both sides of that, what do you get? Well, on G fixed points, 
that gives you a map, which I'll call gamma, from the fixed points we had earlier, those categorical fixed points, to the homotopy fixed points. So you always have a map from the actual fixed points to the homotopy fixed points. And in our case, that so just to make that more explicit, in our case, that means we're going to have a map from the CP to the N fixed points of THH to the homotopy CP to the N fixed points of THH. Um, and so what is the idea then? Well, the idea is that if I want to study these actual fixed points, what is the method? So the method is going to be, well, I, fixed points are hard. I don't have good tools to access the fixed points. Like I just computationally, they're just really difficult to access. But hopefully the homotopy fixed points should be more accessible. So the idea is to study the homotopy fixed points and this map gamma and hope that we can get information about the actual fixed points. Now, why should we believe that the homotopy fixed points will be better? I mean, frankly, the definition in some ways looks worse. Well, the thing, one key thing that makes homotopy fixed points so much more accessible than the actual fixed points is the existence of nice spectral sequences. So in particular, you have a spectral sequence that computes the homotopy fixed points. It computes the homotopy groups of the homotopy fixed points. And what does that look like? Well, I want to compute, uh, let's say, pi star of the CP to the N homotopy fixed homotopy fixed points. Let me make that more clear because it's really this really is for homotopy fixed points. And there's a spectral sequence that does that, which you can get by filtering EG, for instance. And what is the E2 term of that spectral sequence? Well, it's group cohomology like classical group cohomology from homological algebra of the group CP to the N with coefficients in the homotopy groups of topological Hochschild homology. Yeah, Tina, uh, sorry, uh, we have received uh, a couple of questions uh, yeah. for uh, cyclo uh, cyclotomic. Uh, can cyclotomicity be expressed as a relation between the G spectra X and X mesh EFCN without taking fixed points? Um, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know. I mean, from this perspective, <laughs> um, cyclotomicity, I can't say that word so easily, um, is really something about fixed points. You know, I mean, the motivating example for why you would ever think about cyclotomic spectrum in the first place, like, like, why, why this idea of fixing something and getting back the original thing um, is meant to have any tuition is supposed to come from free loop spaces. So free loop spaces have this property that when you um, they have an S1 action by rotation, and when you take fixed points, CN fixed points of that thing, you get back the free loop space. Um, and so I don't, I don't know. I would have to think through whether it makes sense to talk about a cyclotomic spectrum if you remove the fixed points completely. And um, oh, right. So there's a question about the in the a definition small. of a small. Uh, you, uh... When you say that the map are small in the definition of cyclotomic spectrum is an equivalence, is it uh, a level equivalence? Yeah, right. So I was vague here about what I mean for this. I said that these were compatible equivalences. Oh, that reminds me that I also didn't say anything about what I meant by compatible. So let me unpack that a little bit more. Um, so these are S1 spectra, and you want, um, you want them to be equivalent in some sense as S1 spectra. Um, sometimes people require that. They require an equivalence of S1 spectra. Sometimes people require what's called an F equivalence, which is a bit weaker. So when you have equivalences of equivariant spectra, um, you really ask for equivalences on homotopy groups for all fixed points. Um, and in this case, for cyclotomic, you can ask for that only for the fixed points with respect to finite subgroups of S1. And that's also. Um, a reasonable notion of what it means to be cyclotomic here. So that's the equivalence part of it. The compatible part is, you know, you do this for all n, and then there's some commutative diagrams I didn't write down that tell you um, if I look at at this map little r for cn or cm or cnm, how are those things all related? And there's some diagrams that um, that one can write down that I'm just omitting. Yeah. Um, one remaining question. 
Yeah, right. Okay, so I can see this question, which is, if we're just talking about homotopy fixed points now, what were those other things? Um, the spirit of that question, I, I'm inter reinterpreting the spirit of the question, but the spirit of that question as I interpret it is that, so these categorical fixed points that I defined earlier, um, these fixed points up here, so I mentioned that they're badly behaved and I gave you some examples, but they're even more badly behaved than that. Um, if you're, uh, if you don't do a fibrant replacement or if you don't know something special about your spectrum, they're not even really homotopy invariant. So you can have maps uh, that are, you know, you can have an equivariant map that's an underlying weak equivalence and it will not necessarily induce an equivalence on fixed points, which is homotopically like a really bad property. It's a fluky thing, or I mean, it's, it's not, that's a bad way to say it. It's a true thing that for topological Hawk shield homology, these fixed points actually are well behaved. And we'll maybe see a little bit, a glimpse of why that's true later. But uh, in general, this is a bad notion of fixed points for that reason as well, is that homotopically, it's not, it's not really well behaved. And that's the issue that homotopy fixed points are trying to fix. Homotopy fixed points are nicely behaved when you have, they respect these kinds of weak equivalences. It turns out that the actual fixed points for topological Hawk shield homology do as well. But that's sort of something special about THH. Uh, Tim, uh, sorry. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I've received sorry, uh, too many questions uh, tonight. Uh, can you compare your definition of homotopy fixed points with the one used by N-S uh, <laughs> yeah. DG spectrum? Right. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk later about some Nikolaus Schulze perspective. And in Nikolaus Schulze, they're developing a lot of these same uh, tools that we're talking about now. They need them as well. Um, but they're working in an infinity categorical setting. And so they give like a more infinity categorical characterization of these kinds of fixed points that we're talking about, like homotopy fixed points right now. Um, let, let me return to that once we've talked a little bit more about the Nikolaus Schulze work to have some context for that. Um, okay, so where was I? Uh, the, I was claiming that homotopy fixed points are more understandable than actual fixed points because we have nice spectral sequences that can compute them. They have E2 terms and some homological algebra things. And so, um, you know, spectral sequences don't solve all problems. These spectral sequences can still be hard, but at least there's some approach that we can use. So that's the idea, you know, at the end of the talk last time, I gave a lot of examples of algebraic K theory calculations that have been done with trace methods. And this is sort of the idea that went into pretty much all of those calculations. But it turns out this is not quite enough. We need, we need a little bit more than just this map to homotopy fixed points. We're gonna need more structure to try to get a handle on this. So what we're gonna use is a diagram, which comes out of work of Greenlease and May, and we see in equivariant homotopy theory, this kind of diagram appears a lot. So let me develop this diagram for you. And bear with me, things right now are going to start to look like really bad, and then they're going to look better again. So, so uh, bear with me as it starts to look bad. So, okay, we had this cofiber sequence earlier, and let's write it again. So we had a cofiber sequence that was, I take, um, ES1 plus and map it to S naught, projection onto the non-base point, and then I'm gonna name the cofiber of that ES1 tilde. Okay, so now I'm gonna take that cofiber sequence and I'm gonna smash the whole thing with topological Hawk shield homology, which I'm just gonna call T just as notation, just to make this look less messy. So I'm smashing this whole thing with T. Let me, well, okay, fine. I'm gonna do it right down here. So ES1 plus smash T maps to T maps to ES1 tilde. Okay, and now we had this map that we defined above. It came up when we were studying our um, homotopy fixed points. We had a map that looked like this. I'm gonna use that same map here now for topological Hawk shield homology. So I'm gonna map from topological Hawk shield homology to this function spectrum. And I'm gonna do that everywhere in my diagram. So here, this is why I say it's gonna look kind of ugly. So bear with me. This is gonna to map to ES1 plus, smash some function spectrum. This thing is gonna to map to that function thing. This thing will map to, um, oh, I forgot to smash that with T, sorry, typo. ES1 tilde, smash this function. Okay. 
So I've done that and now I'm going to CP fix everything. So everywhere in this diagram, I'm gonna take the CP fix points of what I have. Okay. And I claim that that's meant to be helpful, although that's not at all obvious from what I've written so far. I mean, it looks like it's gotten much worse, right? So that looks bad, but let's try to unpack what just happened. So I wanna start my unpacking by looking at what happened in the middle. So what do we have here in the middle? Well, the top thing is the thing I'm trying to compute. It's those fixed points that I wanted to compute. Now this bottom middle thing, well, that is just the definition of the homotopy fixed points. So that was my definition of the CP homotopy fixed points of T. And this was that map gamma. That was exactly the map you always have from fixed points to homotopy fixed points. So that was the map I said we were gonna try to understand. Okay, so what happened on the left over here? Well, if we look at these things on the left, um, it turns out that there's a theorem due to Adams and uh, comes out of Adams and Lewis and May that says that that thing in the upper left, ES1 plus smash T, the CP fixed points of that is actually something which is a familiar object. It's something that's called the homotopy orbit spectrum. So that's not the definition of the homotopy orbit spectrum. That's a theorem saying that what you recover is the homotopy orbit spectrum. So this upper left is the homotopy orbit spectrum. The lower left also, it turns out, is the homotopy orbit spectrum. And this map is an equivalence. Okay, so that looks better. Now let's move to the lower right, this thing. Well, this thing is by definition, so this is due to Greenlease and May, this object is just the definition, ES1 tilde, smash this function thing, and then I take the CP fixed points. That is, by definition, what's called the Tate construction on topological Hochschild homology. Okay, so this lower right-hand side is something called the Tate construction. Maybe a word about why it makes sense to call that the Tate construction. Um, so let me just note that that object has a spectral sequence that helps compute it, which is called the Tate spectral sequence. And this Tate spectral sequence is a spectral sequence that computes the, we could just do CP to the N Tate construction of a spectrum. And the E2 term of the spectral sequence is classical Tate cohomology. So it's the Tate cohomology of CP to the N with coefficients in the homotopy groups of T. So we saw earlier a similar spectral sequence that com computed the homotopy fixed points. And now I've got a spectral sequence also for that Tate construction. The E2 term now is again in one of these classical homological invariants. This time it's Tate cohomology. Okay, and now all that's left in my diagram is what's happening in this upper right. And what is this thing in the upper right? Well, that is, by definition, the CP geometric fixed points of T. But topological Hochschild homology is cyclotomic. And so the CP geometric fixed points just give you back topological Hochschild homology. And this map is that restriction map that we defined a minute ago. And this map here is often written gamma hat, at least for now. <laughs> We're gonna rename that in a little bit. Okay, so this is, uh, let me box this diagram because this diagram turns out is quite important. And so what is the idea behind all of those algebraic K-theory calculations that I mentioned yesterday? Um, what is the idea? Oh, let me say one thing before that. Let me make a note. So this diagram that I drew for you, it related the CP fixed points to the original spectrum THH. But there's an analogous diagram developed the exact same way, relating uh, the CP to the N fixed points, so that would be your top middle, to the CP to the N minus one fixed points. That would be your top right in the diagram. So you get this diagram more generally. Um, I just did it only for CP for reasons that maybe will become clear in a few minutes. Um, 
Okay, so that's the first note is that we have this analogous diagram um, in this more general case. And the second note is that the bottom row, bottom row is meant to be more computable. So why is that? Well, we've already touched on it. So the bottom row, I have homotopy orbits, homotopy fixed points, and the Tate construction. And all of those things have nice spectral sequences that study them, that compute the homotopy groups of those spectra. So we saw the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence I wrote down. I wrote down the Tate spectral sequence as well. There's also a homotopy orbit spectral sequence. And the E2 term of that one is group homology. So we have these nice spectral sequence tools to understand the bottom row. And so the idea behind all those K-theory calculations that I mentioned last time was the following. Well, we wanna use spectral sequences for the bottom row. Um, we need to know something about these maps. So we need to know something about gamma and gamma hat. Um, and then usually there's some kind of induction, right? So you work up from the CP fixed points to the CP squared to the CP cubed, et cetera. This method has been incredibly powerful in terms of doing algebraic K-theory calculations. Um, for every si different situation that you're working in, for all these different K-theory calculations, like the ones I mentioned yesterday, you know, this needs to be tweaked. Maybe you need an equivariant version of this that's graded by representations, maybe you need to adjust it in different ways. So it's not really just executing this diagram every time. There's a lot of sort of subtlety that goes into it, but this is the, the idea behind a lot of those constructions. So many, many constructions have been done this way and it's very powerful. I wanna emphasize that, but there's a but. <laughs> so, but this approach requires some really serious equivariant stable homotopy theory. So this approach requires serious equivariant stuff. And what do I mean by that? Well, in order to study these things, we had to compute actual fixed points, which as I mentioned is always a problem. We needed to go through an understanding of geometric fixed points, um, homotopy fixed points. We needed to be working with genuine equivariant spectra in order to make sense even of some of these constructions. And recent work of Niklaus and Schulze uh, gives a new perspective on what it means to be cyclotomic and the definition of topological cyclic homology that allows us to avoid some of this difficult equivariant work. So I want to tell you now about um, the Niklaus Schulze definition of what it means to be cyclotomic and how it's related to everything that we just did. So as I mentioned, this is coming out of the 2018 work of Thomas Niklaus and Peter Schulze. So they, what they did is, the first thing they did is they redefined what it means to be a cyclotomic spectrum. So they said the following. A cyclotomic spectrum is a spectrum with S1 action. And S1 equivariant maps uh, phi p from x to that Tate construction on X. And you need maps like this for all primes P. Okay, so I'll say more about this in a second. Let me, now we have two definitions of cyclotomic floating around. So let me, to be clear, the previous definition, the one with the geometric fixed points, I'm now gonna call genuine cyclotomic. So previous definition, I'm gonna refer to as genuine cyclotomic. Okay, and we'll call this Niklaus Schulze cyclotomic or just cyclotomic. Okay, so what's our first observation about this Niklaus Schulze definition of what it means to be cyclotomic? Well, the first thing that I'd observe is that if I had a genuine cyclotomic spectrum, it gives me a cyclotomic spectrum in the sense of Niklaus and Schulze. So how do I see that? Well, we've actually already seen it. So if X is genuine cyclotomic, we went through all this work above to develop this diagram, this green lease may this is also called the isotropy separation diagram. We went through all this work to develop this diagram um, to help study it. And that we did it for THH, but really you could do that for any cyclotomic spectrum. And what did that diagram look like? 
Well, it ended up, once we simplified everything, looking like the following. We had a And so in particular, for any genuine cyclotomic, uh, cyclotomic spectrum, then we have this map. We have the, a map from X to the Tate CP construction for X. That's that map. Now we'll call that phi CP. That's that map uh, in Nicolaus Schultz's definition of what it means to be cyclotomic. Okay, so a genuine cyclotomic spectrum gives me a cyclotomic spectrum. Oh, and I see there's a question. Yeah. Uh, right, so there's a question about not eventually connective spectra. Let me come back to that in a minute. So I haven't gotten yet to the point where we need to talk about whether or not our spectra are bounded below. So I'll, I'll address that um, in a moment. So, um, okay, so this... Uh, so we've said that a genuine cyclotomic spectra gives you a cyclotomic spectra in the sense of Nicolaus Schultz. And so in particular, that means that topological Hochschild homology is cyclotomic in this sense. I mean, that's a little unsatisfying to say, well, we knew it was genuine cyclotomic and so therefore it's Nicolaus Schultz's cyclotomic. So Nicolaus and Schultz also construct more directly a cyclotomic structure on THH, not going through the genuine structure. So let me just mention that. So Nicolaus and Schulze uh, construct a cyclotomic structure directly for THH. And how does that go? Well, I'm not going to go into it uh, in detail, but let me just mention that it uses a map called the Tate diagonal map. So for a spectrum, uh, let's say R, for a spectrum R, there's a map. So in, in spectra, we don't have, in general, diagonal maps. We don't have a map from R to R smash R in general. But there is this sort of corrected version of that called the Tate diagonal. So you have a map from R to uh, R smashed with itself P times after taking the Tate CP construction on there. So this is kind of like a replacement for diagonal maps in spectra. And what they do to show THH has a cyclotomic structure is they use an appropriate subdivision and they show that this Tate diagonal in cooperation with a subdivision induces a map from the topological Hochschild homology of R to the Tate CP of the topological Hochschild homology of R. Tina, uh, there is a question yeah. about the definition. Uh, why not to use instead the map uh, from X to X upper TS1 as an alternative to the Nicolaus Scholz uh, definition? Um, we're going to come back to that object, uh, the Tate S1 construction on X momentarily and see how that comes into this Nicolaus Schultz picture as well. So that certainly plays a role here um, when we get to talk about uh, topological cyclic homology. So we'll get to that momentarily. Um, okay, so I've said so far that a genuine cyclotomic spectrum is cyclotomic and that topological Hochschild homology is cyclotomic um, in this new sense. But of course, a big question then is, well, are the, are the, notions of cyclotomic the same, right? We want to, we would like to know that the Nicolaus Schultz, uh, the argument is that this new definition is capturing what it means to be cyclotomic. So how does it relate to the definition of Bakhtad, Chang, and Madsen? And the theorem then from Nicolaus and Schultz, uh, sort of the, maybe the main theorem there from uh, this work is that, so we have a functor from genuine cyclotomic spectra, so we said any genuine cyclotomic spectra will give us a cyclotomic spectrum in the sense of Nicolaus Schulze. Uh. So we have a functor like this. And what they prove is that this is an equivalence of infinity categories as long as your spectra are bounded below. So this is an equivalence of infinity categories when restricted. to bounded below spectra. Okay, so in other words, for bounded below spectra, indeed their definition of cyclotomic recovers the classical definition of cyclotomic that we're so used to using for our trace method approach um, to algebraic K theory. Um, so 
Okay, so Nicholas and Schultz now have redefined what it means to be cyclotomic in this in this new way, and it checked that at least for bounded below spectra, it agrees with um, the classical notion. But they, this new characterization of cyclotomic also allows them to give a new characterization of topological cyclic homology. So in particular, they prove that you can re-characterize topological cyclic homology. So now we've been talking about rings, so let's let A be a ring. You can write the topological cyclic homology then as some uh, equalizer. And it's going to be an equalizer of maps from this, from the homotopy S1 fixed points of THH. I'm going to take two maps here to the product over primes P of what I get when I take THH of A and take the Tate CP construction and then homotopy S1 fix that. So okay, and there are two, yes. Another question about uh, genuinization functor. Is it describable or uh, is the equivalence uh, proved without having a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, so um, it's a great question. So the to go in the inverse direction, it turns out that when you look at these, um, the, these, Oh, right, okay. So <laughs> let me back up for a minute. Um, I haven't really dug into this yet. I'm going to say something about it in a moment. But when we talked about genuine spectra, what did we need? We needed this genuine notion of a G spectrum. And when you look at Nikolaus Schultz's definition of things, um, what's happened here? Well, I'm not asking for a genuine G spectrum anymore. I'm asking for a spectrum with an S1 action. That's different. That's a much uh, more naive notion of equivariance. And so one key thing is you need to know that you have a map that you need to be able to look at those spectra with G actions sitting inside genuine spectra. So that sort of gives you a way of thinking about uh, to go back. And that's, that uh, functor is what's called Borel completion, which is this, this thing that we've been seeing all along, which is like functions from EG plus into your spectrum. And then you take, uh, right, just that. I realized that I wasn't directly addressing your question, which is about the inverse to this functor. Um, yes, they do need to have some understanding of the inverse to that functor as well. Um, and that's where the bounded below, my apologies for that, I feel badly. Um, okay. So, so uh, right, let me continue with where I was before that. Um, so my, um, so Niklaus and Schulte give a new definition then of topological cyclic homology or, or they prove that you can give this new formula for topological cyclic homology. And it looks like the following, we can write it as this equalizer where I have two maps. One of them I'm gonna call can for canonical and the other one, I'm going to write uh, CPHS1. So what are those two maps? Well, um, the, the lower one is sort of easy to see what that is. So I had a map. The cyclotomic structure gives me a map from the um, topological Hochschild homology to the Tate CP construction. That's the um, Frobenius map and the definition of what it means to be cyclotomic. And so this map is just the HS1 fixed points of that, homotopy S1 fixed points. So that's the lower map. It comes directly from that cyclotomic structure. And what is the upper map, this canonical map? Well, the canonical map is then not relying on the cyclotomic structure. To get the canonical map, um, we say the following. Well, I have these homotopy S1 fixed points, and I could identify those instead as Let's take first the homotopy CP fixed points and then the homotopy S1 mod CP fixed points. So I'm just breaking that down in that way. And so now um, S1 mod CP, as we've discussed, is isomorphic to S1. So I could identify this as homotopy CP fixed points followed by homotopy S1 fixed points. And then I claim that there's a map from there to the T, the CP Tate construction homotopy S1 fixed points. And that map is a canonical map. So what is this map, this last map here? 
Well, we actually saw it earlier. When we developed that diagram, we saw that we always have a map from homotopy fixed points to the Tate construction. So that's what this canonical map is down here. It's the map from the homotopy fixed points to the Tate construction, and then we take homotopy S1 fixed points of that. Um, let me just mention that uh, sometimes when you see the Nikolaus Schulte formula for topological cyclic homology, you see it written a bit differently. So let me mention that as well. So um, you can denote, you sometimes see these homotopy S1 fixed points denoted as TC minus. So this is notation for homotopy S1 fixed points. Somebody was asking about this at the end of the talk yesterday. This is called topological negative cyclic homology. And there's also notation just a moment ago, somebody was asking about the um, Tate S1 construction, and that is called topological periodic homology. So again, that's notation. So this is topological periodic homology. And Nikolaus and Schulze um, prove that this right-hand side of their equalizer, this thing, this big product that they have over here, that this product is really just a completion of topological periodic homology. And so a lot of times when you see the Nikolaus Schulze, um, Sorry, now my iPad is mad. Um, this Nikolaus Schulze formula, you see it written as follows, that it's the equalizer of two maps from negative to topological negative cyclic homology to topological periodic homology, the canonical map and a map induced by the Frobenius. OK, so the. So this is the Nikolaus Schulte uh, formula for computing topological cyclic homology. And I uh, am pretty much out of time, but let me just take two minutes to say um, why this is nice. So what is the advantage of this Nikolaus Schulze approach? So one reason that this is nicer um, is because in the, as I was touching on a moment ago, sometime when my computer crashed, um, the classical setup, you need to consider topological Hochschild homology as a genuine S1 spectrum. So you need this genuine equivariant theory. It's built out of these spaces coming from representations. Nikolaus Schulze are considering something much, much uh, more naive in terms of equivariance. They're considering um, just THH as an S1 equivariant object in spectra. Another way to think about that is if you look at the Nikolaus Schulze definition of topological cyclic homology, what do you need to compute? Well, you need to compute homotopy fixed points, the Tate construction, homotopy fixed points. Those are all those sort of more accessible bottom row kinds of constructions from equivariant stable homotopy theory, not that stuff on the top row that was so hard to get your handle on. So they've moved away from this like really deep notion of equivariance. And it turns out that that's been very. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry to have interrupted you. Uh, we yeah. received a, a question. Uh, are the negative homotopy groups of TC minus the same as negative homotopy groups of TC or something? No, I mean, the, the TC, the minus part is because TC minus, like, you know, yesterday we talked about negative cyclic homology, the algebraic theory, and we wanted some topological analog to that. And we said it was topological cyclic homology, and it, it is, but topological negative cyclic homology is also in some sense the right, yeah, it's hard to explain. The, the homotopy S1 fixed points here are not the right thing for the Boxed Zhang Madsen approach to uh, trace methods. So, you know, people, this object, these homotopy S1 fixed points have been around for a long time, but nobody ever studied them because they didn't, uh, it's not the right notion of topological cyclic homology for trace methods. Like the, there's not a nice approximation theorem relating K theory and this TC minus. Um, but the calling this TC minus is because it is more directly, like if you just took negative cyclic homology in algebra and asked, what is the topological analog? This is probably the definition that you would write down, homotopy S1 fixed points. So that's how it gets that name, TC minus. Um, OK, so I want to end with uh, just a, a concrete explanation of why of some results showing how this is nice to consider these things um, 
in this less deep notion of equivariance. So let me mention a theorem of Hesselholt and Madsen for many, quite a few years ago now. So they proved this amazing theorem, which is that if K is a perfect field of characteristic P, Hesselholt and Madsen computed all the algebraic K theory groups of truncated polynomials over K. And they have some concrete answer in terms of it vectors. If you were in the first talk this morning, um, there was some discussion of it vectors, but if you're not familiar, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Just that's a concrete calculation of these K groups. The even groups are zero. So they proved this theorem, and this is a beautiful theorem, but this was an incredibly hard calculation. So to do this, the gist of what they did is, well, you need to start by understanding fixed points of this truncated polynomial algebra. And it turns out this thing splits as the topological Hochschild homology of K smash the cyclic bar construction on some space. This is a pointed monoid. It's the pointed monoid 0, 1, x through x to the a minus 1, where x to the a is equal to 0. So I'm not going to dwell on that, but let's just say there is this cyclic bar construction that uh, it splits into. Now that seems nice to have this splitting, and it is, but the problem is if you want to compute fixed points of this thing on the left, which you need to, to do TC via box to chang madsen what you need on the right is you need the S1 equivariant homotopy type of this cyclic bar construction. In other words, you need to know how to build it from representation spheres. And that maybe doesn't sound like a hard question, but that is an incredibly hard question. So Hessel and Madsen have beautiful work where they um, describe this equivariant homotopy type, and it leads them to some equivariant calculations. So this leads them to calculate, well, you need fixed points of THH, but because you split it, it's just fixed points of THH of K. So that seems good. But because of this whole bit about the equivariant homotopy type, the kinds of homotopy groups you need to compute now are equivariant. This is homotopy graded by representations. So all you need to know about that, if you don't know anything about ROG graded equivariant homotopy theory, is that it's hard, right? Ordinary homotopy theory is hard. You throw representations in the mix, it gets even worse. So they were able to do those equivariant calculations, understand this cyclic bar construction, and produce this beautiful calculation, but this is really difficult mathematics that went into that. In 2020, so that happened in the 90s. In 2020, uh, Martin Spears reproved the Hesselholt Madsen result. So he recovers uh, this exact result that I have uh, written up here above of Hesselholt and Madsen. But now with this new Nikolaus Schulze approach, you only need to know, the only thing you need about this cyclic bar construction, you still split it like this, but the only thing you need to know about that cyclic bar construction is its homology. Well, a little bit more than that, you need to know its homology and the action of what's called the cons operator. But that makes this, this calculation way, way more approachable. So as a last closing note, let me just note that similarly, um, in 2014, Hesselholt made a conjecture. Um, actually, I think the conjecture was earlier, but it was published in 2014, where he was interested in the algebraic K-theory of planar cuspidal curves. And he had a really explicit conjecture. So this is the K-theory of K adjoin X and Y, modulo Y to the A minus X to the B, where A and B are relatively prime and K is a perfect FP algebra. Okay, so he wanted to compute these groups and he made in 2014, he published a really concrete conjecture of what are the K-theory groups of, of these planar cuspidal curves. The missing piece in his conjecture, the thing that he couldn't figure out how to do and nobody could figure out how to do is that it depended on the equivariant homotopy type of some cyclic bar construction for some other monoid. And as I said, that question, although it seems simple enough, is a really difficult question, understanding these, um, these equivariant homotopy types. So that conjecture stood open and, uh, uh, until very recently. And then in 2019, Hesselholt and Nikolaus proved his conjecture 
Um, and the nice thing about it is that they were able to avoid that equivariant homotopy type altogether by using the approach of Nikolaus Schulze. Okay, I'm over time, so I'm gonna stop, but let me just mention that um, on Thursday when I'm back, um, what we're going to do is, so today we talked about topological cyclic homology. On Thursday, we're going to talk a bit more about topological Hochschild homology. And in particular, talk about a relationship between topological Hochschild homology and equivariant norms of Hill, Hopkins, and Ravenel, um, and how that leads to some equivariant generalizations of topological Hochschild homology and Hochschild homology. But I'm sorry uh, for going over time and for the disruption, but I'll stop there. Yeah, it's all right. Let's thank the speaker. and. Uh... Uh, this is the last talk uh, for uh, today. Any questions at all? Uh, can I ask a silly question? Yeah. Is there, is there a um, classical way of viewing th these uh, um, constructions? In other words, is there any way to recover this in the cyclic, usual cyclic homology? Is there an analog of... of uh, topological cyclic homology from this point of view of uh, Nicholas Schulze? Or does this really only live in uh, homotopy land? Um, some of it only lives in homotopy land. I mean, so um, like ordinary Hochschild homology is not cyclotomic. So uh, it doesn't really make sense to try to like do the exact analog of this topological theory in the algebra because you don't have that. Um, but there certainly is, like, you can bring this topological perspective to some of those algebraic constructions, and you can view, for instance, um, negative cyclic homology, like, you can think of that as uh, homotopy S1 fixed points of a Hochschild homology spectrum, ordinary algebraic periodic homology, you can view as, um, like, a Tate construction on an algebraic, on a Hochschild homology spectrum. So there are pieces of it which do translate into the um, algebra setting, but in some general sense, uh, no, because Hochschild homology is not cyclotomic. Oh, just one, one last question. The Tate construction, yeah. if you just do this in group cohomology, can you write down the same formula as you, as you write for spectra? Does that work? Oh, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? the, it's a, it's I mean, you have, you have nice relationships between the spectral version and the algebraic version. Like if you do the Tate construction in spectra for eilenberg mclean things, you get back algebraic things like you would want. So, I mean, in that okay, sense, that's, yes. That's what I was asking, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, okay, Tina, we received a couple of questions, further questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, I thought I remember that uh, TC of A was something like THH of A uh, lower HS of 1. How are these related? Yeah, topological cyclic homology, it's in, so it's not the homotopy S1 orbits of THH. It's closer to the homotopy S1 fixed points of THH, or at least that's like the thing that you might guess it, you would guess it to be is like homotopy S1 fixed points. Because when you think about how we defined TC, it was like you took CP fixed points, then CP squared fixed points and so on, then you took some limit. So you might think, well, why didn't I just take S1 fixed points to get TC? Um, the S1 fixed points, you can't do that because they're badly behaved. Like we talked about earlier, sometimes like, uh, in general, those categorical fixed points have bad behavior where you have like weak equivalences that don't induce equivalences on fixed points. The homotopy fixed point, S1 fixed points are just not the right thing to be the analog of TC. You don't have good comparison theorems with algebraic K theory. So, you know, you could think of the homotopy S1 fixed points, which we now call TC minus, as being some kind of approximation um, to topological cyclic homology, but it's not, it's not the right thing in terms of get, recovering K-theory. Okay, thank you. Uh, another uh, question. Can the equivariant homotopy type of n cyclic be recovered from these new calculations now? Um, I mean, in some general sense, no, you're just working around it. I mean, in the specific case of Lars's like conjecture, where it was like he very conjecturally determined this equivariant homotopy type, I'm not sh sure whether the calculational result forces, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. In some broad sense, no. I mean, you're, you, the goal is to get around the equivariant homotopy type by only needing to know the homology of that thing. Um, and so you wouldn't expect to recover the homotopy type. 
in that one case, because the conjecture was so specific, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can recover the conjecture from the calculation. Uh, okay, and another question. Could you get a topological cyclic by taking fixed points uh, with respect to some profinite version of S1? I mean, that's maybe I, if I'm understanding the correct the question correctly, I mean, you know, maybe that's sort of what you are doing, right? I mean, to get TC with fixed points, you're taking this CP fixed points and CP squared fixed points, CP cubed fixed points, et cetera, and, and taking some limit across all of those. And so um, in that sense, yes, but maybe I'm not sure what exactly you're asking. Okay. Um, any other questions for today? Uh, yeah, uh, we have received uh, th three questions, and so. Uh, okay, so John, you're asking if one has a map from the x to the Tate S1 spectrum, where x is naive S1, then is it true that this induces a Nikola Schulze cyclotomic spectrum? Um. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to think about that a little bit. So you're so if you have a map from X to the topological periodic homology of X, does that guarantee that it's cyclotomic? Um, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I don't have a good answer for you on that. Immediately clear. Uh, another question: Doesn't uh, X uh, uh, X equals T H H? Come equipped with comes equipped with uh, such a map from X to X T S one. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, but I. But again, I don't know if that, um, like in general, automatically gives you the cyclotomic bit. Yeah. I'm sorry. I would just. It's hard for me to think about that on the fly. <laughs> I'd have to think about that some more. Um, Okay, I see that there's a question about don't non-homotopy fixed points depend on which model of spectra you're using, which model are we using then? Um, yeah, so everything that I did is in orthogonal G spectra. That was the model that I implicitly was using under everything that I said. But you're right that there are these issues with the non, uh, non-homotopy fixed points. In particular, like if you don't know that in general, things aren't vibrant, those aren't going to be well behaved. I mean, I, I haven't really said anything about Boxstead's construction of topological Hochschild homology yet, but the point maybe is that Boxstead's model for topological Hochschild homology somehow acts like vibrant replacement and ends up giving you this nice construction for which those fixed points are well behaved. But implicitly everywhere, my, my equivariant spectra were orthogonal G spectra. Okay, another question from Andrew Smith. Uh, should not you recover the type of EP uh, wedge and cyclic instead, since we specify the geometric CN fixed points, but not the S1 fixed points? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think this is back to the previous question about what would you recover about the equivariant homotopy type of the cyclic bar construction. Um, and I don't even, I mean, I don't even know that you would recover that from the K-theory calculations themselves. Um, I mean, I would think of it instead as like you're able to go through some different route where you don't even need that piece as the input data. So I'm not exactly sure like what the best you could get out of that, but um, I wouldn't expect to fully recover it. Okay, Tina, and uh, the remaining comment. Uh, I <laughs> you find from, uh, map from John. <laughs> A comment from John. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the dualizing spectrum no map does it for you. Uh, I be, I believe. Uh, I think that's just a comment in response to the previous one. Yeah, there are, yeah, two comments. Uh, okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker again, and so. Uh,